My name is Marcella Schulach, and I'm the director of the Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing. It's my privilege to welcome you all here tonight to our fourth <coughs> biannual International <coughs> Writers' Conference. Our conference title, Second Sight, is a pun, referring to place as well as vision. With distance comes perspective. Sometimes the distance is temporal, and sometimes it's geographical. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there, goes the opening sentence of L.P. Hartley's novel, The Go-Between. And Salman Rushdie famously inverts this in his essay, Imaginary Homelands. It is my presence that is foreign, and the past is home, albeit a lost home in a lost city, in the mists of lost time. Nearly all of us in the room are immigrants or the children of immigrants and refugees, and for some the migration was forced, for others it was chosen. The chosen are forced, migration is a condition that deframes and disorients, even under the best of situations. Abba Hoffman writes about her childhood immigration from Poland to Canada thus, being deframed, so to speak, from everything familiar, makes for a certain fertile detachment and gives one new ways of observing and seeing. This perhaps is the great advantage for a writer of exile, the compensation for the loss and the formal bonus that it gives you a perspective, a vantage point. And so displacement gives one a second sight, spelled S-I-G-H-T. And here I do mean a dual perspective. In writing, perspective or a point of view means the place from which you stand when you look and describe what you see there. For to have a voice, you must absolutely have a place. Of course, second sight also refers to sensory to extrasensory perception, which transcends time and place, the power to perceive things not present to the senses, what we call revelation. And tonight, Gabriella Calvo Caressi will be addressing sight as a sensory perception and revelation, at least in your prose work, right? Okay. Now you have to read your prose. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Monday and Tuesday will explore sight as place, with writers whose work is situated in worlds defined by multiple languages cultures, and nations. And these works traverse boundaries, or they render boundaries irrelevant. And looking at their biographies, I'm struck with the distance everyone had to travel to get here. On Tuesday, we'll hear from Xu Si, the, Indonesian, the Chinese Indonesian native of Hong Kong. She's a faculty member at Vermont College of Fine Arts and a writer in residence. She's the founder and director of the City University of Hong Kong's International Low Residency MFA. And tomorrow night, we're fortunate to have Orlando Menes, born in Peru to Cuban parents. And he directs the creative writing program at my MFA alma mater, the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. Orlando will join Israeli Michal Govrin, the daughter of an Israeli pioneer father and a Holocaust survivor mother. Michal Gobrin is a novelist, poet, and theater director who works in Hebrew, French, and English. These talented writers will pair up with our bar faculty members to give free public workshops for the next two days, and we deeply appreciate their greatness of spirit and their willingness to forego an honorarium is what makes, these, um, makes it possible for us to offer this conference free for the public and also the workshops, so thanks. In keeping with the idea of second sight, we're featuring hybrid literary works, works that cross or eliminate genre distinctions in the same way that literature written from second sights cross national, cultural, and linguistic boundaries. And that will be the Illinois Review reading on Tuesday, which will launch the print edition, and you've all seen copies of it in the foyer, its sentences. And tomorrow morning, the CNF student, Miriam Rother, who's in the audience there, the professional choreographer, will usher us into the pre-generic world of ancient Greece. She's read ancient phases and urns to recreate a Greek choral dance to the ode to man for us from Sophocles. 
This year has brought us many gifts. We've had two visiting writer and instructors in creative nonfiction, Rachel Kadish, and her article about teaching here just appeared in the Jewish Daily Forward yesterday. Did anybody read it? Yeah, it has a very encouraging title called Literary Bomb Shelter. <laughs> It's on the site. Yes, it's on the site, great. Asad <laughs> Gavran taught fiction during which time he won the extremely prestigious Bernstein Literary Prize for his novel, The Hilltop. And this year's conference will feature five of the six alumni and current students who have published books since the last conference two years ago. Six of them, six, that's good. <laughs> They'll be reading on Monday. We extend a special welcome to Heather Rudolph, mother of Shandy and wife of Sheldon, of blessed memory, who's here with her daughter, Simone Singer. And the financial and spiritual support of the Rudolph family is really what makes this program and the conference possible, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We also extend welcome and gratitude to Wendy Sandler, who has instituted the Andrea Mariah Memorial Prize in Poetry in honor of her sister and our former student. And we're grateful to the Lecture Institute for Literary Research and the Lewis Family Foundation for International Conferences in the Humanities for their generous support. On a personal note, this is the part where we thank everybody. On a personal note, I'd like to thank my writing colleagues, Evan Fallenberg, a wonderfully creative, charismatic fiction coordinator, and Linda Ziswick, a wonderful poetry coordinator, who really is the soul of the program. Michael Kramer, our steering committee chair who teaches the William Solomon Jewish Art Seminar and who, with Linda Ziskwit, is a founding member of the program. I'd like to thank Nadia Jacobson. This is her first conference. Last time she was so frightened of it, she thought she had a baby instead of doing this. But <laughs> <laughs> she did a wonderful job. It's great. Um, and if I fail to mention anybody, it's because you're so integral to this professional program that I can't imagine myself without you, so I probably should be thanking you most of all. Um, it's been a challenging year also for our department, and several of our faculty members are bravely battling illnesses of their own and family members. And because of recent unexpected surgeries and treatments, we're especially grateful that our visiting writers have agreed to last-minute program switches and to giving writing workshops in secondary genres. With this in spirit, our Dean Joel Walters, Professor of Linguistics, and Professor William Kohlbrenner, Chair of the English Department, and our Creative Nonfiction Instructor. Professor Kohlbrenner is recovering very well from a very recent bypass surgery. And I'll now turn the microphone over to Michael Kramer, who will welcome you all on their behalf and on his own. goes back more than four years. Um, I remember was it 10, 11 years ago, uh, our first conference, uh, and Shandy was standing here in this room and um, inaugurating the program with a, a very, very large conference that first year. Uh, Rebecca Goldstein was here, Melvin Bouquet, Ida Stolman, Pearl Abraham, many, many, many writers. Uh, I would remember all of them now. Uh, the name of that conference was. Uh, no, that was not the first one. Uh, the first one was called Creative Text Jewish Context. And um, in that conference, I remember um, Shandy was also looking for somebody to do the introductions. And um, Alan Hoffman and I uh, said to her, you know, you're doing the introductions. She was very nervous about it, and she got up, and of course she was wonderful and articulate and charming. Um, that conference um, really inaugurated not only the program, but the series of conferences that uh, Shane did herself organized after that, and uh, Marcella after that. and. Um, up till this point, uh, as you can tell from the title of the first one, Creative Text Jewish Contexts, uh, the conferences have really had sort of central Jewish themes. Um, but Chandy 
wasn't that narrow a person. Uh, Shandy was a very, very large uh, intellect and heart. And uh, everybody knows her famous book, her most famous, her favorite book um, was yeah. Moby, Moby Dick. Um, uh, Melville, as far as I know, was not a Jewish writer. Um, and her scholarly work uh, looked to the connections, the conversations uh, between uh, Jewish culture and uh, the culture, in particular, of America, but more broadly, the culture of the world. And uh, this conference is breaking away. And it, um, looking to that other side of Shandy, I think, um, to see the conversations that we can have uh, between our own um, a very complex culture, uh, whether American Jewish, Israeli Jewish, um, Israeli non-Jewish, uh, but that, that culture that we have, that we sort of cultivate here uh, in this country, in this department, um, and also, more, but in conversation with uh, writers this year uh, from, from Hong Kong, uh, from Peru, um, and uh, we have an ancient Greek dance. Uh, we're definitely branching out, and I think Shandy would be uh, very, very happy uh, with that branching. So, uh, Hedda, Simone, friends, family, um, let the festivities begin. <laughs> Gabriela Cavacaresi is a poet and an essayist whose most recent book, Apocalyptic Swing, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award. Her poems have been featured in the New York Times, the Boston Review, Washington Post, and Poetry Magazine. She writes the sports desk column. <laughs> For the best American poetry blog, she's a complete human being. <laughs> and it is, is, she's on the advisory board of the Rumpus Poetry Book Club. She's been the recipient of numerous awards um, and fellowships. And um, I think I'll skip those because those are on the, the back. <coughs> she's a senior poetry editor for the Los Angeles Review of Books and an assistant professor and a Walker Percy Fellow in Poetry at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The first time I saw Gabriella Calva Caressi was in the photo on the back cover of her first book, the last time I saw Amelia Earhart. It was a long time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the title poem immediately became the creative writing poetry exercise of 2005. All over America, graduate students began writing their own versions. The last time I saw Slobodan Milosevic was featured in the book of my former classmate, which won the 2010 New Directions Prize. And the last time I saw Herod was the central poem in our own Jane Medved's poetry chapbook which was a finalist for a national poetry competition, and it's coming out in June, and you'll hear this poem probably um, tomorrow, Tuesday, when we, tomorrow when we have the reading. So imitation is indeed the highest form of flattery. On November t uh, 2012, during Operation Pillar of Defense, when I'd been living in Israel for exactly 18 months, I received the following email from Gabby, who I've never met. I'm the poetry editor for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I'm working very hard and with a lot of success to deepen the discussion of poetry in our pages so it moves beyond basic reviewing and really starts to build a world of writers discussing what it is to be a poet in the world, to make poems in the world. I see what's going on in Gaza, and I realize I don't even know the questions to ask, and I know many people feel that way, and I also know lots of people are saying things while having no real understanding of what's going on. I have this amazing space that draws many thousands of readers, and what I've tried to do is use it for rigorous conversation. Gabby was offering me a seat in the Gaza Round Table, and at the time, I really wish she'd asked me to talk about something for which I was better qualified, like reversing global warming or the formula for figuring out state taxes in Indiana. <laughs> um, but I was hooked by three things in her email. 
She wanted a rigorous conversation, not inflammatory statements to drive up viewer hits. I was impressed with her vision of what poetry was for. Gabby thought poetry could teach us what questions to ask. She believed in poetry that promoted understanding among individual human beings. Furthermore, she believed it was a poet's responsibility to facilitate communication among individual human beings, even during war. Gabriela's own work is delightful, funny, smart, heartbreaking, and honest, and it's always intensely ethical and extraordinarily human, and I'm so glad she's with us tonight. <laughs>
two books, and then I may read some poems from this third book I'm working on, or I may read a little prose. I'll move around a little bit, and then we're going to have questions. And, um, but this idea of sight is very interesting to me, because so much of um, my life is ruled uh, in good ways and more challenging ways by the fact that I have this uh, visual uh, neurological difference called nystagmus. And um, it means, as you see me walking around, my eyes are always moving like this. I didn't walk until very, um, until very late in life. And um, because of that, and probably because of other things, very often I I'm very interested in the idea that Elizabeth Bishop talks about. She talks about, I like the place, I like the idea of the place. This goes very much to my, am I seeing this? I like what I'm seeing. Is that what I'm seeing? Maybe I'm seeing, not seeing what I'm seeing. So, um, and, and I think that's been a good way to also come to this country and, and think, what am I seeing, and what do I want? What do I what do I want to be seeing, and is that what I'm seeing? Um, pastoral. We are approaching the river, approaching the vast pines and power plants, the place the snow begins to darken to red. Here is the river. Here is the last point of our looking. Will it ever be a church again? I tried to count every vein in the body. I waited at the river's edge, watched my breath and the boys playing hockey, the ice breaking ships still far off waiting for nightfall. I watched our town, the mines and quarries, shale, brownstone, the bellworks not far off, and the church our body wanted. There's a story I don't remember anymore about the time our dog fell through the ice, how we stood on the shore as firemen made their way to the broken off part she clung to, how the boys skated warily in the distance and the men said, get off, it isn't safe anymore. How they sprinted down river, the smallest boy sent back for news of the dogs thrashing, and he moved with his head down, and the sound of the blades coming towards us just close enough so I can see the sun glint on the steel of his skate. Then he's gone back to them, and the men are pulling at the dog. Now a rope around her neck pleads, come home, come home. The lone boy making his way away from us, going out from shore to where we can't see them. So low to the ground, his arms scything the air. Ha, huh, ha, huh. I am standing on the shore, and from somewhere there is cheering, and the animal is shaking and breathing hard. We have never wanted anything but this. This is called The Last Time I Saw Amelia Earhart, and um, it's so amazing to hear that graduate students were writing like poems based on this, because I wrote these poems in grad school after I said to my teacher, Lucy Barcoido, what if I am always only writing poems about the death of my mother? And she said to me, a variant of what the poet Marie Howe had said to me, but she said, well, maybe you're always going to be writing about the death of your mother. So you're going to have to figure out other ways to get at it. And, um, and so this was an exercise I gave myself. So it's, you know, teachers and teachers and teachers and teachers. The last time I saw Amelia Earhart, Clem Sanders, bystander. It was late spring and silent, beach grass, switched like skirts of women walking past shop windows on their way to church, heads bent beside their husbands come up from orange groves, just greeting. I was distracted by a bird which was no more than shoal dust kicked up by the wind. I missed her waving goodbye, saw only her back, her body bowing to enter the thing. Bo McNeely, flight mechanic. I go back there sometimes and think about things I could have done differently. Little things, really, like looking at her when she spoke to me or giving her my jacket when she got cold. Things you would do for anyone. One time she said, the body of a plane 
was like the belly of a horse. The whole bar cried, crazy bitch, when I told them that. My dad used to come home dark from the mines and beat his day out of us. You couldn't tell soot from bruises until you watched. Sometimes I dream of flying. Mostly, it's that she's come back. We're hunkered under the plane, and she's telling me a thing or two about a world away from here. Diane McGinty, St. Mary's Home for Wayward Girls. I'm a little weak, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Everybody makes mistakes says something they don't mean. He was the first and kind. He said we should get away. I guess they all say that till they're standing on your porch, fists in their pockets, saying they can't come in and why aren't you more careful? I don't think she meant for it to happen. She probably just lost control and before she knew everything had changed. I bet she was scared all along but couldn't tell anyone because they just say she got herself into this mess and had better get herself out. When I wrote this poem, I have not <clears throat> read this poem but a long time. When I wrote this poem in graduate school, uh, it, Diane McGinty was sort of based on the fact that my mother uh, got pregnant when she was 16. She had a boy and she was sent to one of these, I haven't seen this movie, Philomena, but I guess it's correct, just like that. Mm -hmm. She was sent to one of these homes for Catholic girls uh, and had this baby and then he was taken away and given to a family. She never told me about him. Um, I found out about him later after she died. Um, and when I wrote this poem, I thought that I would never meet him. And uh, eight months ago, he found me. And I haven't read this poem since I, uh, since he found me. And it's Mother's Day, and so it's kind of beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> His name's Kevin. And my mother's name is Diane. <clears throat> David Putnam, stepson. I didn't want to be there, and she knew it. Joked about it. Her sandpaper voice calling, Chicken Little, afraid it'll all come crashing down? It wasn't that at all. She was always leaving, always climbing up from where we could reach her, even at home or on the street. You would look away, and she would be gone, walking between cars or just standing there not answering you as she said her name or touched the arm of her coat. She was already gone. I knew, because there was no difference between the sky swallowing her and living in her house. Doris Lerman, housewife. It's easy to lose someone. Last week, walking my son to school, I turned away for a second. Next thing I know, he's in the street, and I'm running around him crying because in my mind he's gone. Bones littering the ground like a plate shattered so fine you're picking up pieces for weeks. And it's not just outdoors, in the schoolyard or the bus station. You can lose a person at home, in the safest possible place, a place you could walk blindfolded. That's why I, was, I wasn't surprised when that woman got lost, because it's always like that. One day, walking through a room, you realize what you were holding is gone, and you can't find it, even when you get down on your knees. Harry Manning, former radio operator. I dream she's found me hiding on a farm along the shore, and my fault she left and stayed away so long. She says she's not mad, but isn't coming back because everyone's given up. Even her husband packed away her clothes and someone burned her maps. So she couldn't get home if she tried, and she doesn't want to. Then she turns away and I'm left, call, I'm left alone calling, how will I get home without you? The whole world tastes like salt. Crows overhead shout, gone, gone, gone. She can't help me anymore. I'll have to walk. 
Joel Sullivan, minor. How do you tell your children they'll never get away? Tell them their only choice is factories or the mines, bent heads or blackened lungs. Amelia Earhart is a dream my daughter won't give up. Sometimes I want to shake her, tell her what small towns are, how the coal dust coats your skin till darkness never leaves you, and the sky doesn't matter much when you're wheezing underground. She won't believe that woman's dead. She says, I think it's romantic to disappear. I bite my tongue to keep from get telling her she'll get her chance in time. John Larkin, Ground Control. When her signal died, I left the room and washed my hands till the hot water ran out. It was all static, the radio crackling like strip shirts on the line, her husband hunched over, head in his hands. Nothing looked different because no one could move, fold the maps, turn off the lights, and leave her wherever she'd gone. We watched the planes in the field disappear leaving us alone as evening came down. Susan James, high school teacher. Matthew works the night shift and sleeps his way through class. Camille's father lost an arm to the canning factory. She left us to take his place. I could go on all day talking about 15-year-olds who might as well be 40. I wanted them to see her fly. This is the picture I have. Five o'clock in the morning, they're all here except Matthew, who meets us at the factory gate. We're walking. There isn't any bus. I tell them to hurry, and they're trying, but they're tired. I want them to make it so badly, I tell them to run. And then we're there, and the roar, she's waving goodbye, and we're all waving back, even after she's in the plane, even after she's gone, we're waving and grinning, all the way back to class, where Matthew struggles to keep his eyes open, and Ramon says, if I was her, I'd never come back. George Putnam, husband. <clears throat> Afterwards, she was everywhere. Her map in the glove compartment, shoes on the stairs, her wedding ring on the bathroom sink. I found her house keys by the phone and wonder how she'd get back in. Of course, I wasn't the only one. Everybody thought they'd seen her, especially children who wondered if she was hiding from me. One girl wrote, when my father yells, I hide in the barn. Do you have a barn? <laughs> <laughs> the last time I saw Amelia Earhart, she was three steps ahead of me, crossing to the other side of the street. I almost died trying to reach her, called her name over the traffic, and when she turned back, it was a young man, startled by my grasping hand, saying, sorry, but I was mistaken. Then she was gone. Clothes sent, cars sold, nothing to look for, except airplanes. They're everywhere now, and take me back to her, turning away from our expectant faces. called Having Never Been to Gettysburg, which means something even different now that I've moved to the South. <laughs> Having Never Been to Gettysburg. Sedge grass, little blue stem, bristle cone pine. Oh, if this were the worst of it. Not me, that insatiable lyric, darkening the doorway of small town beauty parlors, brush grass, salt cedar, big top dahlia, greening above moldering bones. Who knows, I never told the truth, not once in my life. My name unknown to the field mouse, the skeletal cats scouring slaughterhouse floors. I was never sorry. I let the town drift from view, my mother still humming with current from the hospital's source, Larkspur, Prometheus, my unwavering hand. Mother's Day. Um, this is called Acknowledgement 1964. Um, this is for my father, um, though it is not his favorite poem in America. 
Acknowledgement, 1964. And the title takes its name from um, the John Coltrane's The Love Supreme. Could have gone west. Could have packed your things. Who cares that you weren't old enough to drive? Could have sold yourself to truckers and highwaymen. Could have gone down the dark road between home and somewhere better. The whole world watching TV and no one thinking of you. Could have got lost. Could have said, I don't know. When the waitress asked, where do you live at? You could have lied and said, New Jersey or Mobile. Of course, that assumes you get past Mason Dixon. You could have seen battlefields, Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, even Chicago, if you waded deep enough into summer, could have slept with your head to the ground like your sister, her ear to the transistor, listening, listening to, I want to hold your hand. You could have said, fuck the Beatles, and left them behind, shooting the lights out of every stadium, every coliseum. You could have made the girls scream, because you were the stranger under the bleachers, that ember of the cigarette burning in the darkness just outside their porch lights glow. You could have named them Helen, Rochelle, Ida May, and in Texas, Irene Rosenberg, a girl just as lonely as you. Imagine, you're leaving before it ever got started. Where's that girl you married? You don't know. You were halfway to Billings or Provo or Bend. You watched the cities of the Midwest burn. You threw bottles and never cut your hair. Remember the drum kit in Schlesinger's instruments? How you crawled through the broken window and banged away in the shards of that city if they could have seen you then. All muscle and heart, sweating, sweating, no more stupid melody holding you back, just the bass line. Just the gas line hissing and your feet on the pedal. You could have gotten away. The country was different. A boy could walk without getting beaten beyond an inch of his life, without getting lashed to a fence in God-forsaken Wyoming. Why, God hadn't forsaken Wyoming or Birmingham yet. Cheney, Goodman, and Shorners safe in their beds. Perhaps you passed by them. You could have passed me by and saved yourself the whole mess. My mother doesn't know you yet. She's on her back in the grass with some other man's son. So I wrote this first book of poems about my mother, and then I thought, I'll never write another poem about my mother. And then I wrote a whole second book of poems about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. A love supreme. You beautiful, broke back horse of my heart. Proud, debonair, not quite there in the head. You current with no river in sight. Current as confetti after parades. You small town. Italian ice shop next to brothels beside the highway, sweet and sweaty. You high as a kite coming down. You suburban sprawled all over the bed. You dead? Not nearly. Not yet. A love supreme. Breathless in the backwoods, backlit by what joy could hold you, I see you, naked as stripped wire, all coiled against the quarry man's hands. You dance the polecat dance. I lay by the tires unseen. I crawled here, sniffing the ground for clues. Bloodhound, girl, child, rooting you out. Get gone, you'd say. No way, ma mare. I love you like Elvis loved pistols. Stroking you in the television light, the possibility of that music better than all the stages in the world. Girl, you keep rocking just like so. I'll go down river and catch you a fish with my dirty hands. No man can contain the love I have for you, nor the rapt attention. Take my hand. Take my whole life, too. I've slicked my hair back. I've made myself a boy for you. So 
a lot of boxing in this book. My editor said, how many boxing poems can the American public take? <laughs> and then we endeavored to find out. <laughs> this is called um, Blues for uh, Ruby, Golds Ruby Goldstein. And Ruby Goldstein was a fighter, uh, but he um, is more famous for having been um, the referee <coughs> in the fight um, between Emile Griffith and, and Benny Perret. Uh, in which Benny Perret was killed. And um, many people feel the fight went on too long. Um, the day before uh, the fight, during the press conference, Benny Perret uh, called Emile Griffith a faggot. And um, Emile Griffith, uh, who actually happened to be uh, closeted and very much a homosexual, said to uh, Benny Perret, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. Um, it's, a very, it's a very complicated uh, story. I don't think he held the fight too long. Other things happened. Terrible. Um, but this is also his, I'm, we're going to talk about documentary and about research. How you get obsessions. And how you read one story, like you think, oh, I'm going to write a great poem about Neil Griffith. And then all of a sudden you write in the voice of someone else, not about Neil Griffith at all. Who's for Ruby Goldstein? The best time is sunset when the streets get quiet. No more kids playing stickball under the window. No guys looking up to see if you're home. What does anybody know about a body anyway? You can take a worse beating than most can imagine. You get every rib broken, and your eyes punch shut, and your kidneys can bleed like you see at the butcher. You can forget your name and still be in church the next morning passing the plate. That's why guys like to get in fights at the bar. No one who's taken a punch really thinks he'll get killed. I mean, sometimes it's different. One time, out on the street, this kid knocked off to a cop. Just some skinny kid out from somewhere, not from somewhere around here. Probably he lived further uptown. They took him around the back of my building and let him know what was what, how this part of town ran. I remember him down on his knees, not making a sound, just slumping forward and rocking back as he took the boot in the face. One would grab his ha head like a barber, checking the length of his hair. And he'd pull so the kid rose up a little, and then he'd let go. He went like that for a while. That kid probably thought he was done for. Yeah, he probably thought they'd leave him for dead, which they did. He was slight, what we'd have called a flit or a fairy, or something unkind. But you know, he got up a few hours later. At first, he just crawled, but he found his legs pretty soon. He got up and looked around. You could see him take a big breath before he walked into the street. That was brave for that kid to do that. And the guys let him go without making much of a fuss. I think a beer can got thrown, or maybe a couple guys spit. Nothing too bad after what he'd been through. I was skinny myself, the jewel of the ghetto. That's what they called me back in the 30s. So I know the kind of lip you take from guys bigger than you. All heart. That's what most little guys are. But that counts for a lot in the gym, or the ring, all you gotta do is get up one more time than the other guy thinks you can. It's true. Nothing breaks a guy's spirit like a skinny kid getting up off the floor. Some nights, I could see the moment I won before I won. I'd take every punch that some fighter could think of. I'd feel them just let themselves loose in my gut till they let go, or sometimes the gut and the head and the gut one more time. And here's something no fighter will tell you. There's a sound you make when you hit and hit and you're nothing but motion. It's not like sounds you make with your wife or your girl. It's rougher and darker, and sometimes it feels better. And after, you feel so relaxed. You can't really explain it and make it sound normal. But a lot of folks know what I mean. And I'd let the guy do it. Let him get to where he'd want me to hold him up for a bit. He would almost thank me for not falling down. We'd stand there till the ref pushed us apart, both of us catching our breath. 
And those big guys just couldn't believe it, that I was still there, not passed out on the mat. One time, I even whispered, it's over, in this guy's ear, real quiet, so as not to embarrass him, just look. And then I walked back to my corner, and I came out and punched him once on the jaw. He looked up like someone called him for dinner, and then he just fell. I can still see him against the blue of the mat, like when you're lying down and a man comes into view above you with the whole sky behind him. What I'm trying to say is, a body can take a hell of a lot. It's 100 degrees today in this city, and still the kids are out in the streets, the women are outside at the market, there's the girl in the next building wanting to play violin. And sure, they're all sweating and wiping their foreheads, but who's going to say stop? They don't want to. That's the truth. Oh, I'm sorry. This is called Temple Beth Israel. It was at a point where, you know, the Lakers had not won recently. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in Los Angeles. Um, and my walks, talk about documentary, my walks um, from my neighborhood to Pico Robertson, all these different neighborhoods, um, meant a great deal to me. I, w I walked eight miles a day before I would come home and sit down and write. And people say Los Angeles isn't um, a walking city, but that's not really true because the whole central part of Los Angeles uh, is uh, Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods. And so it's actually, there's a huge part of Los Angeles where everybody walks all the time. Temple Beth Israel. I thought I would write to you about the bombings of all those churches and temples in the south. But instead, I took a corner, and there, like the sun I wake to in this distant city, a boy resplendent in his yarmulke and Lakers jacket. It has happened before, but we are almost champions now. In the arena, on the radio, on every school bus, there is the song of our city winning something. He was no higher than my chest heaving from a run as I tried to burn off a night of restless dreams. I thought I would write about the people standing on the corners in the midst of all that rubble and destruction, but here are the fathers carrying their sons to show, and my legs are moving like I always dreamt they could. If I could talk to you in the midst of all this traffic and choose to speak of joy instead of the suffering of so many people laughing in the streets, Shenandoah, La Cienega, Doheny with its schools and girls in their long skirts, does this make this less of a poem? How do we make a world when so many don't want us here? Here are the boys in their black suits and golden jackets. Here are the hills dry for months with no rain. Here I am learning to read again. We sound the alarm, and it is as sweet as it is sorrowful. Our hands are in the air. We are running. We are using our legs. We are holding buckets of water and bright flags. We wear jerseys with the names of temporary kings upon them. We are breathing. We are breathing. We are almost champions now. In the summer of 1964, my mother was pregnant um, with my brother Kevin, and there were ter terrible violence happening all over the South in the name of people who would have called themselves very good Christians. Um, it was a very complicated time, and I think it had a lot to do with. And it's interesting living in the South now and thinking about this, you know, Rosary Catholic Church. I remember the time she showed it to me each bead with a carving of a saint inside, chasm between robe and flesh, or the hard line of a walking stick, no longer than the leg of a staple. That's what faith was, something I couldn't see but felt all over, like a charge, she'd say, like when they put the wires on my head and I shook and shook. I couldn't imagine. Most days, 
I didn't even try. Why not play outside or bring every can in the house to the store for recycling? Much better than working the one thought over. Mother in the bed, and if I looked closer, mother with the wires thin as cricket's legs and humming already before the music even reached her. Mother glistening. Mother glowing with the spirit, all the windows of her mind blown out and the light pouring in so you can't tell the fire from the moon and the organ straining in the heat, the groan of the instrument pushed past comfort toward the highest register, but maybe not, maybe it's such a low groaning you could feel it without moving. How hot the pipes must have gotten, those men in their white suits stepping back from her body so as not to get caught by the current, and this is just one day, she'd say. This is just one day of suffering. I'm just going to read two short poems. I was going to read a whole suite from this new book, but I'll just read two, please. But I've been re eating so much delicious food here, so. <clears throat> Some kids killed a goat and cooked him in the ground. They had us over deep in the hills on someone's ranch. It was good. They cooked him all day and asked us to come by, and he loved it. The band leader got out of the car laughing. It was good. The kids ambling towards us, lights making stars all around. They said, come over. The air smelled like smoke. They lifted the goat out of the ground. All their hands moving along it on the wood table, seven knives and everyone laughing, the kids picking off the skin and handing me some, then the ribs cut through, then the haunches and the hams. Someone took the head for soup, one of the older women. Someone brought plates piled high with corn. This is so good, the band leader said. It came right off the bone. We put it in tortillas and ate it with our fingers in the darkness with little lights shining above. It wasn't greasy like I thought it would be. Boys were feeding girls and laughing. Someone thanked the goat and all the sweet kids said, thank you, goat. And the band leader said, thank you, goat and grinned at me, all the kids running around, and one ran up and said, I know who you are, and the band leader said, who am I? And the boy squealed and ran away, come here, I heard the band leader say, come here, and feeding me the juiciest meat, and kissing the steam off my chin. I do love goat. I do. That's a Texas poem, too. Can you feel that? Being, that's a big ranch poem. I'm from Texas. That's like, that's like <laughs> when you've been out in the middle of the desert writing poems for six weeks and someone says, hey, we're cooking a goat. Do you want to come out and eat a goat? And you're like, I just need some human contact. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's delicious. That was the Landon Foundation. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Landon Foundation, for letting me <laughs> eat a goat in the middle of the yeah. desert. <laughs> He's huge. Standing there in the woods where I didn't even see him at first. He doesn't know I'm looking and then he moves his he moves a little bit and kicks the ground. I was walking by myself as the sun set. I kept going in deeper to the greenest spot until I found a clearing. He was the clearing. He took the clearing up and stood there and watched me till I saw him. I saw his shoulders first and then his neck. I think he was so golden in the sun, I didn't know what he was. And I thought the branches were his horns. I thought he was an eight-point stag, and now his chest made a giant heart out of me, out of my eyes looking, and he let me look. He stood there in the green, not moving. I thought his horns were leaves. I saw eight branches coming from his head. He didn't stop my looking. He didn't run away. I watched the whole of him. I saw his arms and the taper of his legs. He let me watch him for maybe hours, but really moments like a gift. Like when you're almost home and smell them cooking supper, but you're still outside and could just turn back around. We stood like that together. He let me touch the whole of him, every rise and muscle. He let me rest on the hollow of his neck and breathe it in for four whole breaths. He said my name, or he shook his head inside the branches and sighed and let the light come into us. He let the light into us for a while. Thank you so much. Um, I thought it would be, if it's okay with everyone, first of all, thank you. You all are awesome.
Um, it felt really great. I thought that um, we could talk for a little while with your questions, and then if there was time, I could read this this little bit of a prose thing. And if not, then there's no time. Okay. That's good. Um, let's see how to do this. This looks a little. Can you hear me? Neither one of us are very tall. I'm loud, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I carry, right? Do That's this. okay. Do we need yeah. it for the recording? How about I come closer? You can. Come I don't closer. mind that. Okay. I've been waiting all evening. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to a plane, this isn't bad at all. Right? I mean, okay. all right. Although, the guy did say just feel it. He did. So really, <laughs> it's the best travel ever. I'm putting on my glasses because I want to look at the back of this book. And I like what Van Jordan said about this particular book. This is Apocalyptic Swing. And it's about fighting and also about Jazz and blues, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and religion, and, yeah. My mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, he says that these document, among other things, he says that these document um, moments in our recent incendiary history that are surprisingly forgotten moments, and. I'm just curious, I can't help but wonder, almost all of these are documentary poems. They're documenting these almost forgotten moments that were incredibly intense and really defining of a culture of America in the 20th century. How do you choose um, and how do you go about documenting these things? We, we, a lot of us here do documentary poetry, so this might be interesting. You know, so. I was, um, in some ways I was, I mean, I guess I was unlucky. I, I couldn't live with my mom because she was very ill. Um, but because of that, I ended up living with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. This does get at your point, I promise. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I lived with my grandparents and um, so, and I didn't walk very well. And so I was in a house of storytellers that I think even by my father's generation, like it's not the same. You know, my father has given me a great deal, but it was really my grandparents who, like everything was a story. And not only that, my, my grandfather was a lawyer in Hartford, Connecticut, but we lived in this tiny, tiny rural town. And so he was also the lawyer in that town and people would come to the house. Like they would come to the house with their grievances or they want to talk to him about things. And he would say to me, um, you sit here. He's like, and listen, he said, everyone is going to come in and they're going to tell the same, they're gonna, like, it's all gonna be about the same story, but it's gonna be different. Every one of them is gonna tell it differently. And the other thing he would do was, he was a lawyer, is whenever um, there was like a day off from school, he would bring me to the courtroom with him and he would give me a yellow legal pad, like, cause he was also a probate judge. And he would have me sit in the back and he would say, take all the notes you can and I'm gonna ask you questions over lunch. I'm gonna see what you think. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like really how I became a poet because because I sat there and he would really ask me. Like I would sit there and I so I would like take my notes, you know, really serious. I love a yellow legal pad, I love it. <laughs> and um, then we would go and we would sit and have lunch and he would ask me, he would say, so what did you hear, you know? And one of the things he would say is like, what you heard isn't half of what those people think they were saying, you know? And um, in the midst of this, I also had this visual disability where for a while, I didn't get glasses until I was like five years old, but I was basically like blind. But like putting on those glasses was this really intense thing of like, I remember my grandmother driving me like home from getting my glasses and I would not keep them on. And she said, but it's so great to see. And I was like, but I can see, like I can see, you know, I could see. And then I put these glasses on and everything looked different and sharp. and. So, so much of, um, for me, documentary, and this really interesting thing that Van picks up on, I think of, yeah, I do talk about things that people don't necessarily, you know, historical events that people don't necessarily remember, but do actually are really resonant for smaller groups of people. Mm -hmm. Really comes from um, having grown up in a place where individuals were coming in, talking intimately about these larger things that they were placing themselves within and sort of talking about their own human stake in them. And I was, um, I lived in this world where everything was blurry and then all of, except my grandparents also owned movie theaters. So like the only thing that was clear to me was I would sit, we owned drive-ins and I would like sit in my pajamas on the car, like looking at movies. And I realized like five years ago, the reason I love movies so much and I'm so intensely engaged with them is they were the only thing I saw clearly for the first like six years of my life. 
this thing for documentary with me is this idea of people thinking everybody like thinks they see it and then so often the greatest griefs of our life I feel like are mine are like those moment that moment where someone's like you didn't see it like you thought you saw it but this is actually like what it looked like mm-hmm. does that make sense you know mm-hmm. and um and then do you choose to say like okay I see it that way or do you say like no like it really happened that other way and then you have to live in this world of like suspended belief you know and um, or you have to live in a movie which I do a lot of time um, so so for me I love this word documentary because um, that makes it sound so much more like sure than it really is when really like the thing that's most interesting about documentary movies or any kind of documentary project is like looking at this beautiful fallibility of human beings. And one of the things that I think, um, gosh, I'm old enough now to talk about my students, but it's true. Like one of the things I think that my students often do when they write, you know, documentary poems or persona poems in the voice of like someone they know is they really like lock it down so much and they don't let that person be unsure, you know, or they don't let the person like, probably more realistically like think they're sure but like you know they're not like that they're you know what I mean like and um they don't allow fallibility to come in because uh they want to be the hero you know the speaker should be the hero and um documentary work for me has always been about finding the events and the and the way to bring people's like fallibility into that space and not fallibility like I killed that person oops which is like sort of what I when I was initially writing um Persona poems, I would always pick the biggest character in the story. Do you know? Like, I was going to be, you know, I was going to write, like, not the, I was going to be Adam or Eve. Like, I wasn't going to be some, you know, sloth, like, sitting behind the tree, like, looking at these crazy people, like, my God, they really are arguing, you know? I mean, that's, the sloth is much more interesting, you know what I mean? But I wanted to be, this and so one of the things for me that's been interesting in, in these events and in documentary work has been like how to let myself be the sloth a little bit more because mm-hmm. that's pretty that's more interesting. Mm-hmm. And do you get your inspiration from the, the news, the films, the you know, what you well, the, the circus fire, which is the sort of the, the central poem of my first book, is this very long series of persona poems about this circus fire in Hartford, Connecticut. That was totally for my grandparents because um, because it was in 1944, and also because I in Hartford um, and around Hartford. I don't know if anyone here is from Connecticut or like lived in Connecticut or if people here remember the circus fire that happened in the 40s. Um, Barnum and Bailey came to Hartford, Connecticut, and the way they used to uh, waterproof, uh, rainproof outdoor circus tents was to uh, cover them in uh, paraffin and gasoline. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine. And so um, that did not, I mean, it was terrible. And um, everybody like lost someone. And it was like right at the time of the war too. So it was like, it was all women and kids. Like it wasn't, and um, my grandfather had so many clients in his practice who had had people who had like even years later who had lost family members. And um, in Hartford, it was such a big deal still that there was one girl who had never been identified, but you could st- her like features were very clear. Little Miss fifteen sixty five. Mm-hmm. Um, they found out her name later. Um, when I was growing up, they didn't find out her identity until like I think maybe when I was in my twenties. Every like July, they would put a picture of her in the paper of her dead body in the paper, asking if anybody knew who she was. So that was like haunting. And a lot of these, a lot of these stories come from like I hear from someone, or I, you know, um, my my professor Lucy Barcaroto, whose name I bring up a lot, but she really is ex- extraordinary. Um, at Columbia, what she would say about persona poems, which is sort of like documentary, right? Is like you want to find the space like on your body and on your speaker's body where the two of you are like fused, mm-hmm. and you can't really tell the two of you apart. And once you find that space, which is not often the most obvious space, then, then that's where it comes from. So I, I really wait for something to resonate with me. Mm-hmm. I love it. She's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's another feature in these poems, and I'm not quite sure that, that we got it from the reading, but 
These are formally gorgeous poems. There's an entire sonnet sequence in here, a crown sonnet. There are litanies, there are hazels, there are um, pantoums. Um, so this is really engaged with form, with, with literary form. And I just was wondering, what's your, what's a form that you're working with now or that you've recently loved and what does it do for you? Well, yeah. I should say, I should start by saying like, I was really awful at forms. Like I was really, um, I don't know of the writers in this room. I mean, I was terrible at metrics and scansion and all that stuff because it had been taught to me like um, I was in some kind of like um, mathematics class, right? Mm -hmm. And I was terrible at mathematics. Um, I even had a craft teacher who like at Sarah Lawrence College looked at me and said, with all seriousness, she said, you have such a beautiful ear, but this is a disaster. She said, are you dyslexic? Like what is wrong? You know, and I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I don't even know how to respond to that, but B, um, I guess I respond to it by like having a career and working really hard, but like I, I like working in this, but I, I um, and what dyslexia would have to do with like not being able to craft a poem? There were so many levels on which that was wrong. But um, <laughs> but I um, I got to Stanford University and I studied with Ken Fields, um, who a lot of poets in here, like Alan Shapiro, all these people will talk about if they studied with him that he's the person who taught them form. Mm. Did you? Did he help you with form? Yeah, absolutely. Right. He. Um, he just taught it as like an internal physical process. Mm -hmm. And so then, once I began to understand kind of the organic, like why something would be a villanelle and not a sonnet, like emotionally, then I began to really work at it and I got, I got better at it. Um, the pantoum was really hard for me. I thought like, wow, I haven't really read a pantoum I like. And I try and do one thing a day like I could fail at. That's my rule for myself. Do one thing a day you can fail terribly at. This is this is it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. um, it's a good and and it, yeah. even, like it can go. And it's a good thing to do. And so, I wrote this pantoum, um, and I and that was a real that was a moment a formal moment for me where like I did I did something I had not been able to do before. Can I read it? Yeah. Is that okay? Please. Do we have time? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Pantoum is like kind of a tough form. Um, I'll just read it and you'll and you you will figure it out though. And this is um, this guy Billy Sunday, who was a, he was a baseball player like in the '30s. He was also an evangelical preacher on the radio. Don't quit your day job. Um, Pantoum Evangel Billy Sunday. On summer nights, we'd listen to him preach. God loves you, and God will cut you down. Who knew one man could watch over us from our radio's dark corners? Could hear us? Pray for God to love us, to cut our urges down to a size we could manage. And he played baseball. <coughs> Who knew one man could watch over his glove and see a girl whittled down to a size he could manage? And he played till the dark came. I lived in Weathersfield. Was his glove, was his guile whittled down to the size of a mole's claw? I burrowed till the dark came. I lived in Weathersfield, loved the fishmonger's son, his zipper near to the size of a mole's claw. I burrowed like rats in leaching fields, mouth full of earth, near the fishmonger's son, his zipper near, nearer my God to thee, a song he'd sing like a frog in a leaching field, its mouth full of the spirit, we'd hear it coming through, nearer my God to thee, a song he'd sing, we couldn't make out the song's words because of the spirit, He'd hear, we'd hear our coming through all of that static and our mother's prayers. We couldn't make out the song's words because of my moaning. I couldn't be quiet amidst all that static. Our mothers prayed like crowds at the beehive, our minor league park. Of my moaning, I couldn't be quiet any more than the Red Sox could win one. For the crowds at beehive minor league park, I can't explain the lore of salvation any more than the Red Sox could win one. I fell to my knees in the back of our house. I can't explain the lore of salvation, how he shook as I held him in my mouth. I fell to my knees in the back of our house as swans came up from our still pond to see how he shook as I held him in my mouth. I was like a town on Sunday morning as swans came up from our still pond to see the lawns empty 
but for one on his knees, I was like a town on Sunday morning, was the empty square, was the parable, the lawns empty, but for one on his knees, and the girl who brought him there to be watched, was the empty square the parable, or were the swans who tensed and chuffed their wings, and the girl who brought him there to be watched by anyone who opened their window, or the swans who tensed and chuffed their wings, where did she think this would leave her but lost? Anyone who opened their window could see we looked nothing like rapture. I ask, where did I think this would leave me but lost as a salesman selling Bibles in church? See, we looked nothing like rapture. I asked him to be gentle. He cried at the end like a salesman selling Bibles in church. What have I done? I am done for. Please tell him to be gentle. He cried at the end and hid himself from me. Billy Sunday asked, what have you done? You are done for. Please tell me again how it ended. The swans left and hid themselves from me. Billy Sunday asked if I bathed in the blood of the lamb. Show me again how it ended. The swans hissed. In the darkness, I listened to them preach. So like that was this thing that I thought I could never do. And I, I mean, who knows if it's good or not, but like I, I gave myself the risk of doing that, and that completely changed my formal life. Mm -hmm. And then, like, had me like think about this is like, do you want to like stand up with me and do something? Okay. 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 I'm sure. Is this terrible? Like, but see, here's the thing. Um, so, so I'm working on these new poems right now. People are probably so ready to go home. Um, but I, I'm working on these poems right now, and there are three ways of, of three voices in this new book. Uh, it's called Rocket Fantastic, and it's uh, it it takes place. It's a little bit different from what I've been doing, but also the same. It's, I think of this as a triptych in these in the third book of the triptych, and it's it takes place during the Vietnam War, um, but nobody really talks overtly about that. Here, are we done? Well, we have ten minutes before. Do we want to do this? Do you want to ask the question? You decide. Do this. I'm just gonna do this. It's okay. like that's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. They look this different. And then oh, we're holding them up? Yeah, that's okay. what I'm saying. We're not reading. I'm oh, saying, okay. like, so this is really, um, like, yeah. <laughs> this is all, here, let's do You this. thought we were going to do, like, a song and dance. Yeah. <laughs> but this could help with, like, oh, and I'll, like, the one I was just, the one I was just reading. So, like, the goat poem I read, like, looks like this. Right? So, like, so the goat yeah. poem I read that looks like this, and then the stag poem I read looks like this, right? And then there's this other voice, and these were like in poetry magazines that look like this. And so one of the things I'm doing formally right now is trying to work with um, my visual disability, where in nystagmus, your eyes go like this, but you have something called a null point, where your eye goes to here, or well, everyone has a different one, but the null point is where your eyes are the stillest. And it feels like a trance. Like it feels so good to find your null point, but you have to, when you're little, train yourself not to do it because it, you'll sit like this all day long. Like mm -hmm. literally, like kids with nystagmus will do that. So I thought, what if I could start making poems where I let my eye go to the null point as I write? And so there's one series of poems. The other poet, the only other poet I know who has nystagmus is uh, was Maureen Nidecker. And I'm convinced that her white space and, and like that is, is her null point. Um, so you have, you have a, you have a um, after the fact we go in every to use any tools. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's that's, that's a thing, and so it's like so this can get into the moment of questions where so the new form is like could you like could I write and let my null point go and then space it and how long do I do it and then so it's either going to be a disaster or it's going to work out okay. Um, questions? <laughs> yeah, people have them. Yeah, I guess it's the worst poem in Poetry Magazine. Huh? Yeah, it's like the worst one. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? We have a few minutes, maybe one question, two questions. Yeah. Does the no point become like a rhythm? That's like such a cool question. Um, because I see the spaces yeah. are almost the same. Well, that's the thing. For me, the null point is like a rhythm, or breaking out of it is like a line break, right? It's like living in the white space and then having to come back to language. Mm -hmm. And so it, I think it creates a rhythm. And one of the other things this book does is I thought, 
could I use the null point like that? And then could I also have patterns of repetition that don't happen in single poems but through other poems? So there are three voices, and without even knowing it, they start to repeat each other. They are all far apart from each other. So could you form like a pantoum or a villanelle like over a series of poems where there's like patterns of repetition? So the null point is one form of rhythm. Yeah, like it absolutely. It's a rhythm, but it's also like um, you know, like when you hit like a gong or like a drum really hard, doom. It's the like four seconds into it, you know, where it's like it's still got depth, you know, it's got a beat, but it's more about depth, if that makes sense. Question? You visualize uh, you visualize your uh, letters as waveforms, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to know about voice. Um, each poem that you read, when you started to read, there was an adjustment that we had to make, which was whose voice is mm -hmm. going to be in this time? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was a character's voice, and sometimes it was your voice, and sometimes mm -hmm. it was a we voice, mm -hmm. um, a plural. And could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, and this is something I'm thinking a lot in this, um, a lot in this third book, because one of the things that happened with my first book was uh, it was one of the best things that happened. I got a, like a four-page single-space re uh, rejection letter from Jill Bielowski at Norton. Wow. And it was amazing. And basically, like, what it was was her talking about persona and our very different relationships to persona. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the second book is basically, like, she doesn't know this, but it, it's basically like this long letter to her mm -hmm. about... Like, well, what does persona mean? And like, what does story mean? Everyone's a persona, you know? And I'm like 10 different personas a day. And that's not the same thing as being 10 different people, you know? Like, and so one of the things that I think about a lot is this idea of um, what it is to create a voice and how easily, even in our own lives, our voices can turn into caricature, you know? Um, how often we are imitating something. Um, so so the, I'm hoping that my thoughts about voice are getting more nuanced. One of the things in the second book was that um, there are very, they are, in a way they're all persona, but they're also not, the real thing about that book is there are no um, personal pronouns in that book. There's no he or she, like there's no gender in the book. And I thought like, could you do it? Like, could you, you know, like he, Ruby Goldstein says like the boy and the he, but whenever anyone's talking about themselves, they never, like, they never, and, and they're long, they're very, like, there's a whole series of poems about this boxer sort of thinking about this, this woman that the boxer loves, or there's another poem called L.A. Woman, which is all about, like, watching this woman undress in the pool, and it's never gendered, and I was interested in this idea of voice and, like, intimacy, so what happens if a reader isn't assigned their gender when they enter, like, a poem? Like, then they have to figure out, like, am I a man looking at a woman? Am I a woman looking at a woman? Am I not gendered, you know? And so, um, and then in this third book that I'm working on, um, there are ostensibly three people speaking, this young girl and then her brother and their older sister. But as the book goes along, it becomes very, it becomes obviously between the older brother and the sister very hard to tell who's talking. And they start having similar they start, they're a world apart from each other and they start having sort of similar hallucinatory moments to the point that you really can't, you know. So I'm, I'm, thinking, of, I'm thinking about that a lot. I've been starting to think about, could you think about poems as, um, in the way like, you know, people think, we're thinking about like Spiral Jetty, like could you think about large form poetic pieces instead of thinking about like, I mean I think series and sequence, although it's something I love, I think it's something now we use so much it almost doesn't mean anything. Like so like could you think about like large form pieces and and so I don't call these poems persona in the third mm -hmm. book. They're very I think of them as variously voiced. Which is like something I'm trying to think about. But I'm for me I think like maybe variously voiced is it is another way to think about it. What is it, the relationship with exactly? I mean, how does how does it come? You seem to have a certain amount of attention. What? I, I have um, 
This is an interesting and complicated question um, that over the next few days, like I'm, I'm still sort of, I would say um, I have a, I have a, uh, what I think of as a serious uh, Judaic religious practice. So I go to Shul, I, uh, I do, do Shabbat, but more than that, like I, I am, um, the, the, I grew up in a, in a very deeply Christian family, um, and I grew up um, without even realizing it. This happened, I was giving a radio interview, and somebody asked me if I kept a journal, and I said no, and they said, well, what do you do at the end of your day to uh, make sense of things? And I said, without even thinking about it, like on the radio, I said, I pray. Wow. Yeah, it's a big moment. But I realized that, um, in that moment, I realized like I pray probably every day, all day, without even thinking about. It. Like I mean, I'm just in sort of conversation with with God. And in fact, when I was little, when I was little, and I say this like everyone should do whatever they want. Like I, you know, I don't know, but um, because I grew up with a mother who was very born again, and that was very difficult for me. It really put me in a kind of space of not talking about faith at all. Um, but when, like, when I was little, I used to have these uh, nightmares, like every night at my grandma's house, and I would wake up, we lived on the river, and I would hear this voice, I would hear this voice, like just like talking and talking, I didn't know what it was saying, talking. but I assumed, all of a sudden I was like, well, I don't know what it's saying, it must be God. I was like, oh, God's talking to me, like telling me it's all gonna be okay, like everything. And for years this went on, like I would wake up, I would hear the voice, and then I moved out of my grandma's house, I, I went to my uh, father's house and lived, and um, you know, I, I grew out of having nightmares all the time, and, one day in my 20s, I was back at my grandparents' house. I, I stayed there a lot, but I was sleeping through the night by then. And I just woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard the voice. And the voice was this guy, there was a power plant down the river, and they just <laughs> test their system. And I'm like, every single night, like the guy was like, three knots to the east, three knots to the west. But, <laughs> and there was this moment where I had to make a decision. Like, did I believe in God or not? Like, I really, it was like, it was like this moment I thought like my heart like broke a little bit and then I was like well I guess I you know I mean it was like well that's the same as anything like he saved me every night like that voice like you know and um so it's a it's a long story but about nine years ago I discovered that Torah study and uh certain kinds of Kabbalistic uh practice, practice and um a, a, an ethical way of life of um, believing that hell is something that you make in the world and not that it's something you're going to be sent to later. Um, and so you have responsibilities in this world towards other people. Um, it just was something that I wanted to wrestle with and really work with. So. Yeah. I see what you raise is an investment for the rest of the world because you're giving the message. Thank you. Last question. Did you, in Los Angeles <laughs> times, did you come across the Happy Minion on uh, Wilshire Boulevard? What's, where, where? The Happy Minion? Where's that? Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> yeah, on Wilshire, but where? Pico, it's on Pico. On oh, Pico? Yeah, I did. in a karate studio on Pico. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right, apparently it's sports. <laughs> <laughs> Does the name Shlomo Karlebach say anything to you? Did you ever hear about him? Wait, what? Shlomo Karlebach. No! Who is it? Who is it? Come back tomorrow and ask him more questions. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, we are in to do lead us through Greek dance, and it's going to be tomorrow at the Wall Center. So that's that thing that looks like a spaceship. Um, what's the gate? Five. 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 It's five. It's building 1401. Building 1401. Next to the parking lot. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you.